Welcome everyone. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm Director of the Institute for Government. Delighted to have you here for this extremely interesting discussion with Stefan de Rink, advisor to Michel Barnier on the Brexit negotiations. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. We've got a great uh, panel here to discuss um, uh, things with Stefan after he's spoken for about 20 minutes at the beginning uh, on his, uh, well, he'll tell us what he wants to, to say. Jill Rutter, who leads the Brexit uh, team here, you will know very well. John Pete, who is political and Brexit editor of The Economist. And Dr. Chris Bickerton of Queen's College, Cambridge, who's author of um, uh, the, uh, the, the European Union, A Citizen's Guide, is now writing another book on populism, that's right, and is uh, that rare thing, an academic voice for leave. Um, not intending that to be a career in itself, but uh, <laughs> uh, very glad to have you all here. Um, with that, Stefan, thank you very much indeed for, for coming. And with no ado, would you like to tell us what you have to say? Sorry for the coziness of our <coughs> top platform. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Institute for Government for, uh, and to Bronwyn Maddox and, and Jill Rutter as well for organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be here and take 20 minutes to talk to you about Brexit and then have a discussion with the panel and the audience on, on these issues which are obviously vital. Now in my talk today, I will not be able to cover as much ground as the work done by the Institute on Brexit, because I read your report and all of us in the office probably, or most of us, read your reports on trade, migration, dispute settlement in the future, customs as the domestic challenges also for the UK on Brexit. Uh, Michel Barnier has said that the UK's withdrawal from the European Union will have important social, human, financial and political consequences. And we need a good public debate. And I think your reports, which contribute to that debate by offering evidence and analysis. And I would also hope that our modest presence here today in Westminster helps sustaining a public debate that is conducive to striking a deal between the EU and the UK. But taking a broader picture, the European Union's contribution to the UK's public debate will inevitably have to remain modest. And one reason for that is that the Commission's resources for public engagement are focused on the future of the Union and less on the UK's withdrawal. Now in my talk today, I will say a few words first on the mandate. I will say a few words on time and enter into what we can say today based on European Council guidelines from last April on the future relationship before concluding. And on the mandate, I would like to start by saying a few words on that as it has been defined in the April European Council guidelines and also taking into account the views of the European Parliament in its resolution from April 2017. Now that mandate is precise, but it also leaves sufficient flexibility to Michel Barnier to negotiate contrary to what some may have claimed. And there is a strong rationale for the sequencing of negotiations which is in that mandate. There is legally Article 50 which puts the emphasis on the arrangements for withdrawal, but politically both the UK and the European Union jointly decided to tackle upfront two possible harms caused by Brexit. One is the uncertainty for life choices made by EU citizens in this country or by UK citizens in the EU. And the other is the risk posed by Northern Ireland leaving the EU legal framework. And that legal framework in combination with EU policies <coughs> has indeed played a facilitating role in the peace process there and in the North-South cooperation under the Good Friday Agreement. And both the EU and the UK are engaged in finding shared solutions on these matters. Therefore, it seems to me that the criticism of sequencing, and as The Economist wrote last Friday, the broader claim of the EU being somewhat imprisoned in legal niceties and not prioritizing strategic interests, meaning constructing the future relationship together, is mainly targeted at that third priority of the first phase, namely the financial settlement. 
I almost wanted to pronounce the name of the column in The Economist, which I think should be pronounced as Badget. But we asked four British people in the office and we got four different replies. <laughs> so I hesitated, but I think I may have gotten it right looking at John's reaction. Now, the financial settlement concerns obligations undertaken at 28, up until the withdrawal date. It's about settling past accounts, not about charging a bill. The UK agreed in 2013 to the current 2014-2020 financial period, and the UK Parliament indeed ratified the own resource decision of the EU, in other words, the system that governs the revenue, which mirrors the agreed expenditure. And Prime Minister May stated in Florence that the UK will honour its obligations. But her speech was specific only on the parts of payments for the current budget until the end of 2020. So at this stage, the UK has indicated that it cannot yet specify the other commitments. Now, why is it so important for the EU to settle this up front? I think that's a crucial question. There is, of course, uncertainty for budget beneficiaries in the 28, in the 28 <coughs> countries. And leaving that uncertainty unanswered before discussing the future would certainly affect the chances for a successful conclusion of the whole negotiation. Postponing this matter would increase political risk, which is not in the longer term interest of the UK and the EU. But most crucial in my view is the following. Before the EU can engage in negotiations on the future, it must know how the UK intends to honour its current obligations enshrined in our current treaty. How could one explain to public opinion and national parliaments in the 27 that the EU started negotiating a new relationship without having clarified first the meaning of current commitments and the implications of, current, of the current relationship? And to those who argue that the choice of these three priority issues for this first phase and that sequencing is a legal nicety that obstructs a strategic discussion on our common future, I would like to say two more things. First, the EU is proud of its achievement, as foreseen by its founders, that rules and legal principles shape the interaction between its member states. So upholding legal principles is in the strategic interest of the EU. And second, some observers in the UK seem to think that financial liabilities from the past could be used to maintain as many benefits of single market membership in the future. But that the EU can never allow to happen. So citizens' rights, Northern Ireland, as actually nicely symbolized in this room by the two gentlemen on that wall, and the financial settlement are the challenges for the next weeks. And Prime Minister Florence, the Prime Minister's speech in Florence has given us new dynamics and certainly decisive progress is within reach. Settling these issues now will guarantee that an atmosphere of serenity and calmness, which is there at our joint negotiating table today, will continue. We will indeed need that calmness and professionalism, which is there on both sides at the negotiation table, in order to scope in the best possible manner our future relationship and define a new balance of rights and obligations between the UK and the EU. Now let me say a few words on time. From the EU side, we certainly wished that we had more advanced compared to where we are today. But our common challenge is, given where we are, is to use the time ahead of us in the best way possible, in the most productive way possible, for the best possible outcome. And certainly the European Council last Friday is clearly in that mindset, as it asked the Council and the Union negotiator to start preparing at 27 internally the guidelines for the future relationship and a possible transition. Given where we are, the ideal scenario for, from where we stand today would be that historians early in 2019 can look back at essentially three periods of nine months, a magic figure that often leads to good results. Nine months from the referendum to the letter of notification till March 2017, Nine months in between the Article 50 letter and reaching sufficient progress by December 2017 on the three priority issues. 
and then nine months in the new year to scope the future relationship as well as agree on a possible transition which would have to be part of the eventual withdrawal agreement. And all of that leaves a few months for parliamentary debates and approval at the end of the process. So let me turn before concluding to a few observations on the future relationship. More preparatory work is to be done with the 27 member states before we can talk in more specific terms on our close partnership for the future. But already today there are a number of certainties worth recalling and they are contained in the European Council guidelines of April 2017. For the future of market integration, in other words for the economic relationship, there is a trade-off. The more a country wants to take back control and stop sharing sovereignty in the European Union, the less benefits it can expect from the European Union. The UK government has made a choice of leaving the single market and the customs union, partly because it wants its own independent trade policy, partly because it no longer wants to accept the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in the new relationship, and also because Britain has stated that it wants a capacity to restrict access by EU citizens to its labour market in a way which EU law does not allow. So the April European Council guidelines, by stressing the indivisibility of the four freedoms, people, services, goods and capital, are clear in, in view of also these choices. And one consequence is that frictionless trade between the UK and the EU will no longer be possible. Michel Barnier recalled this in a speech early July to European business and st stakeholders and trade unions. And it is also shown by the work that the Institute for Government has done on customs issues. The European guidelines furthermore stress the integrity of the single market and the autonomy of decision making of the EU for the future relationship. And it excludes that the UK could participate in certain <coughs> sectors of the single market only. No sector by sector based participation. These principles will in other words structure the future relationship between the UK and the EU. Now of course the EU can have access to that single market and we have a strong mutual interest to make sure that a bilateral trade deal between the EU, EU and the UK facilitates that access as much as possible. If not, we face a no-deal scenario and a trade regime under the basic rules for the WTO for goods and services. And at the risk of being somewhat pedantic perhaps, I would like to stress though the, and spend the, one minute on the difference between access to the single market and participating in the single market. Two concepts that, in my feeling, are often confused. The EU single market, in combination with its customs union, is unique. It is the deepest possible form of economic integration for goods and services. Being inside that single market means you accept being part of common institutional and enforcement structures. That common framework also allows trust in national rules of member states, where the EU does not adopt harmonized standards. That's the mutual recognition principle as introduced by the Court of Justice in the 1970s and the single market as a dynamic concept has evolved and deepened since then. And even though some barriers still exist in some services, the single market eliminates formal requirements between countries and their economic operators. An Irish airline can offer flights between any two cities in the EU because it is in the single aviation market, framed by the European Avi Aviation Safety Agency, by the surveillance role of the European Commission, and by the European Court of Justice as the ultimate guarantor of commonly agreed standards and rules. Free trade agreements, or in aviation terms, open sky agreements, govern the relationship between two markets that have separate jurisdictions, separate rules, separate legatory systems to enforce those rules. This can never replicate the smooth functioning of the single market, but it offers the appropriate model for a country that wants the liberty to diverge from EU rules outside of the EU's enforcement structures. However, given the intensity of economic exchanges between the UK and the EU, clearly issues of level playing field will be an important consideration and are already an important principle put forward by the European Council for the, future, for the negotiations on the future meaning no social dumping, respect for environmental, social standards in both jurisdictions. 
Finally, if you're inside a single market, you obviously participate in decision making. For instance, on the single rule book for financial services. That simplifies doing business for financial service operators, also of UK operators in the single market, and avoiding regulatory arbitrage between countries. And we have worked with the UK and with all member states extremely hard since the financial crisis to restore financial stability through the single rule book for financial services, to avoid also fragmentation of financial markets in our single market. <coughs> it seems that after Brexit, the UK will be no longer want to be, as it wants to be out of the single market, can no longer, of course, participate in that decision making on that single rule book, and its operators will lose the single market passport. Let me add perhaps one observation before moving to the conclusion. And that is an observation on actual negotiations that have been happening over the last five months, which are focused on disentanglement of 44 years of relationships between the UK and the EU. And in those negotiations, at times it has become clear that the UK would like to maintain single market benefits. For instance, for goods not yet placed on the market, or for the capacity of UK bodies to certify single market readiness of goods after Brexit, or still for professionals to maintain a capacity <coughs> to seamlessly provide services in every member state. Now, all those issues, however, in the view of the EU, should be dealt with when we will start the discussion on an ambitious and new trade relationship that we will want to create. Finally, before concluding, beyond trade, important to recall, of course, that the European Council guidelines also call for future partnerships in other areas which I will not dwell on for lack of time. It's about internal security, the fight against terrorism and organized crime, defense cooperation, and such matters. Here, though, I would also like to stress that we will need to find, as the guidelines say, a new balance of rights and obligations between the UK and the EU, and that the autonomy of decision-making of the EU will also be vital in those fields. So to conclude, the EU would like to start the discussion on the future relationship as soon as possible. We can do so as soon as sufficient progress has been achieved on the three priority issues, and the European Council will reassess that progress in December. And we are not far away from that. An extra effort is needed at the next negotiation rounds between now and that European Council in December. Not so much to ask concessions from the UK or to ask concessions from the EU, but simply to determine the principles, the method to protect citizens' rights, where we have made progress, settle past accounts, and for managing the impact of Brexit on the Irish border. In parallel, the EU is starting its internal preparatory work on the future relationship and a possible transition. And while we have worked on this internally in the Commission, we will now do this collectively at 27 and with the European Parliament. Since the referendum, the EU has displayed a remarkable unity in its approach to Brexit. The Prime Minister stated last week in the margin of the European Council that it is in the interest of the UK that the EU27 <coughs> continues to take such a united approach. That unity exists between the Member States and between the EU institutions, the Council, the European Parliament, which will need to ratify the withdrawal agreement before March 2019, and the European Commission in a way which has rarely been witnessed before. That unity is a condition to succeed the negotiations on the withdrawal, as well as on defining the framework for the future relationship by autumn 2018, and for subsequently concluding negotiations on that relationship after withdrawal. As my final comment, there will be no surprise in this room to hear someone who works for the EU <coughs> say that we are indeed stronger and can achieve more when we are united. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Stefan, thank you very much indeed for those, those comments. Um, uh, let me just ask you one thing, maybe, to kick it off, and then we'll go to the panel. How soon could a transition deal be done? Does it have to be, as you've said, part of a final deal I mean, the UK government really wants to know how soon could it be? Well, it all depends on how soon we reach sufficient progress in the first place. And as I said in my remarks, that sufficient progress is not far away from where we are now, 
after five rounds of negotiations in Brussels. But you need to reach that sufficient progress before you can engage in discussions, possible transition, possible and, and the negotiations on the future. The European Council has been clear that it wants to reassess that progress. It can be very quick and things in terms of the additional guidelines <coughs> for the future relationship as well as for the possible transition, all of that can come all very quick. There is certainly a time pressure on all of us and nobody has any interest in slowing down the clock or in slowing down the work. But there is a precondition and it is a prerequisite that we need first sufficient progress on the three priority issues before you can move on into discussing the future relationship. All right, we could then, after sufficient progress have been made, move to discuss a transition even before completing a final deal. Well, internally we are currently now, we need to start discussing with the 27, hmm. what are the terms of such a tra possible transition? I would remind the audience that already in the European Council guidelines there are a number of clearly Im very important indicators on that in terms of the prolongation of the union's acquis with the whole supervisory, regulatory and enforcement structure that mm. goes with that. But that we on our side, since the European Council of last week, need now some time internally mm. at 27 to start discussing what that possible transition exactly means in detail. Okay, well thank you for that. Um, let me go now to the panel. What I've asked them to do is to react um, uh, to what has been said uh, right now, comment on what they think uh, is most significant about that or, or the gaps that have been left, and then, and then throw a few questions back at Stefan. John, will you kick us off? Uh, well, thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and it is obviously a, a, a critical moment in these, in, in these negotiations. Um, I, I think I want to make two broad comments in response to Stefan's very good summary of, of where we are. Um, one is about the approach to negotiations, um, looking at it to quite a large extent from the UK point of view. And then my second is about the eventual destination, which I think is the most important issue of all, which so far hasn't been very much discussed. The approach to negotiations, I mean, this, this is the question that Stefan mentioned about sequencing and um, budgets, criticism of the way it was done. Um, which wasn't by me, by the way. Um, uh, and we don't want to go over it because we are where we are. But I think, I think the important point from the UK's position is that from the minute that the referendum was held, and certainly from the minute that the Article 50 letter was dispatched to Brussels, the UK was essentially in a weak bargaining position. Um, and I think, I think Brussels also needs to realise that that is, that is the truth of, of where we stand. Um, the UK is the demandeur in this negotiation. The EU27 are much bigger. Um, they are much more experienced in negotiations, particularly in trade negotiations, than the UK for obvious reasons. Um, and I think that, that informs a lot of what some people in Brussels and in other countries feel has been you know, disorganisation in, in London, inability to make sufficient progress, as we discovered at the last council, um, and the perception that there are splits inside London, in, inside the cabinet, which is, which is clearly true. But I think it, it all comes under the heading, in a sense, of the UK is in a weak bargaining position. Um, and to, to use a, a diplomatic word that was used by a former permanent representative to the European communities, yesterday in Parliament, <laughs> The minute you trigger Article 50, if you haven't got a clear idea how the negotiations are going to be structured, you will be screwed. Um, uh, and I think he was right when he said that. Um, and that's the reason why, seen from the Commission handling the negotiations, the UK has been reluctant to come forward on um, the extent of its commitments, uh, financial commitments, because from the UK point of view, all, almost all the cards are in the hands of the other member states and in Brussels. The one card that the UK appears to have is the ability to pay over some money. Um, and for obvious reasons, if you treat that as a bargaining game, you're not going to want to play that card immediately before you know what you're going to get. And that's why the UK had reservations about the sequencing adopted for understandable legal and political reasons by, by Brussels. And that's why still the UK is reluctant, as we saw from David Davis yesterday, actually to come forward and say, right, we'll settle all this and we will give you a cheque for something like, shall we call it, 50 billion pounds. Um, 
Because the minute you do that, you lose the ability to use that money card to try and extract a better deal on the final settlement. And I think that dynamic is, is still continuing. And what, and it, what are you calling on the EU to do in, in, in response? Uh, to be sympathetic? To be, to, to, no, to be prepared to offer a more generous free yeah. trade um, deal to Britain than is, uh, currently appears to be on offer. And the, the problem for the UK negotiations... Because of the weakness of the UK position. And it's a and I, think, to generosity. I, think, I think it has a similar... Um, it has a similar dynamic when we come to talk, this is going to be one of my questions, when, when people on this side of the channel come to talk about the merits or otherwise of no deal, um, I happen to think no deal would be a very bad deal. But there are clearly many people who think about this in negotiating terms, who believe that if you cannot walk away from the table, you will get a very bad deal. Um, and I would like to know what Stefan thinks about that thought process. The, you, you have to be prepared to go for no deal in order to extract an, 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 an agreement that is, is of some use to you. That's my sort of first broad comment. My second broad comment is, is about the ultimate destination. And of course, one of the reasons why we and others worried about this sequencing is that we are using up time every single day. And March 2019 is not very far off. And again, as Ivan Rogers said yesterday, there is absolutely no chance of negotiating a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement between the UK and the EU before March 2019. Um, he thinks, and, and I think I share his view, that it, it would be very, very hard even to agree on the framework for such an agreement before then, which is why your question about transition immediately comes, comes in. But the actual nature of that deal um, is, is, is still very much um, an open question. Essentially, I think, as we've been discussing over the last few weeks, it boils down to a version where the Commission and the other member states believe that what the UK is seeking is an equivalent to Canada, but with plus, plus, plus added to it. Uh, whereas what I think some people in London think they're seeking is the equivalent to Norway, but with minus, minus added to it. And the question really is posed, in, a, in essence, by the Florence speech, where she said, we can do so much better than this. Um, is there something in between Norway and Canada that will be reachable and, and agreeable to both the EU27 and the UK? And when you look at this, I'd be interested to know if Stefan has a view. He mentioned unity at the very end, and clearly unity is important to the EU27. And it's been um, impressively maintained throughout the negotiations on phase one. I wonder if unity will be quite as rigidly enforced in phase two, because it seems to be there are definitely some countries, for example, for example Ireland, but also Belgium, the Netherlands, um, France, Denmark, and perhaps Germany that have much stronger interest in a free trade agreement with the, Europe, with the UK than other countries. And I, I see a dynamic next year in which some countries may, may, may be more interested in seeking a deal than others. And I wonder if that will affect the negotiations. OK, great. So we've got no deal. And then we've got uh, the question of, of, um, of what the destination or what a deal might be and whether unity is going to hold together on that. It's my turn. It's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, I absolutely agree with John that we are at a critical moment. Uh, everyone feels that we are at that moment where we could indeed move to, to phase two, but it depends on the preconditions I, I outlined before. And so to John's point that we should then think about this in terms of cards or who is stronger, who is weaker, I would say the following, I think from, from the EU side it is very clear that it is in the mutual interests of the UK and the EU to strike a deal on the future relationship. There is no <coughs> doubt in Brussels' minds about that. So to hold back on something out of fear that not, 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 nothing good would come later, I think is not the world that we are living in. And then I come back to what I said, we need to indeed settle the past accounts before moving into the future. And I think it is beyond what I just said, I think it's very important to realize that the money question is also important in other countries, not just in the UK. So we need to take the drama out of that question in the UK before it becomes a drama in the 27. Because, and that's what I said in my introductory remarks, if we do not do that, we may not find ourselves with the serenity and the calm that we will need in 2018 to be, you know, to, to construct together that new relationship and, and, and to 
construct a framework at least for that new for that new relationship. So yes, we we sometimes look with puzzlement at all the game metaphors that that come up because for us, let's just manage this process in a way that is the most rational for both parties. In a way that, if I can put that in art terms, mitigates the losses on both sides because it eventually. Brexit is a lose-lose proposition from, from how we can see that. On um, Canada plus plus Norway minus, well, what is important is that both of these models have a balance of rights and obligations. You know, it sounds a bit abstract, but it basically means Norway is part of the single market and therefore takes a lot of obligations on it in terms of single market rules, the correct enforcement of that rules and all the enforcement and jurisdiction methods that come with that. Canada does not, and therefore also has less economic benefits. And what we certainly do not want to do in this discussion is mix models in a way that you end up with the privileges or the rights of Norway and the obligations of Canada. We would like that. Well, that is not an offer. <laughs> the Norway model is there, but clearly from the discussion and the, the choices made by the UK government, it wants to leave the single market, it wants to leave the customs union. So that choice is very clear and it's also clear where that leads us to, which is what I then said in my introductory remark. Finally, on the no deal, if I may, yeah. uh, because you asked me that directly. In a, this is an extraordinary negotiation, Michel Barnier often says. And in a normal negotiation, you try to create value on the table and if you don't take it, well, there's no deal. You both walk away and you have the same situation as before you started negotiating. That is not the case in this particular negotiation. Mm. And people have to be, think through the consequences of that. And what, in what, in your view, are the consequences of no deal? Well, if there's no deal, as of April 2019, Clearly, Britain is, UK is for the EU what any other third country in the world is with whom we do not have a preferential trade deal. And that has serious consequences. It means that in terms of the international agreements which are now being discussed, that Britain falls out of that. How much not just trade and <coughs> aviation, others. How much does the EU want to avoid that? is what Britain would like to know. If we reach sufficient progress in the phase one, <laughs> this will be my... We're back, we're back to, I feel I'm not making sufficient progress here. No, but, <laughs> but you can, we're not far yeah, away. No. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave that one there. Chris, we might come back to it there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, thanks, Ronan, for the invitation. Stefan, I, um, I enjoyed uh, listening to you, and I listened very carefully. Um, let me just make a couple of observations and then I have a couple of uh, questions for you. Um, the first observation is, in listening to you speak, um, it strikes me that something which has been a problem, I think, thus far in the negotiations is that there is definitely a clash of negotiation culture here. Um, and the way you were describing it, what you were saying is that the EU has this consensual decision-making procedure, that's the way it operates internally with member states and that the way it approaches this negotiations on Brexit with the UK is in the same spirit. Um, now that's fine, but um, something fundamentally has changed, which is that the conditions for the EU's consensual decision-making um, uh, 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 framework is a, an acceptance of pooled sovereignty on the part of its member states. Now if you have a country exiting the European Union because of a desire to regain or to defend or to instantiate its own national sovereignty, its own popular sovereignty, then you have a real clash. You have the pooled sovereignty of the EU versus this popular sovereignty of the UK. Um, and that creates, I think, a very different negotiation framework. Um, and so I do find it a little bit naive to suggest that on the EU side there is no concern about real politique, about games, about interests, no willingness really to play hardball, that nobody's thinking in these terms. Um, if that's the case, then maybe there should be some sort of rethink about how the Brexit negotiations are, are fundamentally different from 
the, 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 the consensual decision making that structures the life amongst EU member states because the purpose of Brexit is for the UK no longer to be a, an EU member state. So I think that's, part of the, that's been part of the confusion. The second thing I would say is that um, Article 50, when it was written, was not intended as something to work. Uh, it was intended very much as a deterrent. Now, that's not um, a quixotic view that I share that's been said by those who put it together um, as a deterrent. Now, what we have now is a set of negotiations structured fundamentally by uh, an article that, in my view, is not fit for purpose. Um, the deadlines are simply far too short. Um, and it's very unrealistic to try and cram everything in, even if the negotiations were going perfectly well. Um, now, what I think um, uh, uh, we have is a situation where that is actually just a given. There is going to be no rewriting of the terms of the ne those negotiations. But some of the problems also is that we're trying to squeeze in to an incredibly limited time frame a huge amount of stuff. Um, now, it's not common, I think, to have negotiations that are so rigidly structured by treaties of this kind. And that's another reason why negotiations, I think, are, are struggling at the moment. My two questions for you. Um, you laid out, I think, very well what are these priority areas. Uh, uh, the states of EU nationals in the UK, Northern Ireland, and then the, what people call the divorce bill, the financial settlement. My question, the first question to you is, um, in your view, are these all in some way equivalently difficult or equivalently close to being resolved? Is there one that's outstanding versus others? My view is that, ironically enough, the finance um, side is the easiest one to resolve. Both sides accept that there has to be some compromise. Um, the question is identifying a number around which there's an agreement. Um, the reason why it's become a sticking point is, I think, for what John said, it's simply been taken up by the UK team as their only real sort of uh, their only real uh, bargaining chip. Um, but in principle, it's not difficult to resolve. The other two are much more difficult. You know, in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement was premised on two member states um, being the main parties to that agreement. That allowed a lot of fuzziness in that agreement. Um, redesigning it so that it's premised on an EU member state and a non-EU member state is very different. Um, but my question there is, do you feel that we're equally close to settlement on all of these areas, or is there one that's, uh, that's, more, uh, that's more difficult? The final one is, um, is to return to this question of transition, which seems to me very misleading, because however well you design the transitional period, the question is transitioning <coughs> to what? Okay. That's the only important question, in fact. All the transitional questions are secondary to that. Um, one of the problems, I think, at the moment is that the debate around transition is being a, is used as a way to defer, in the UK, really thinking about what the transition is leading to. And so my question to you is, if, if there was firm acceptance on the UK side that because of the implications of the referendum, the UK was going to leave the customs union, leave the single market, and relate to the EU as a third, as an outside uh, country. Therefore, all it wanted was to negotiate a free trade agreement. Um, now, uh, people talk about Canada style. We dismiss the Norway arrangement, which is not that. So if we say that's the end goal. Now, given that the British relationship to uh, the EU27 in regulatory terms is fundamentally different from Canada was because it's been a member state, do you think, if that was put on the table as the goal, the end goal for, for, for negotiating the new relationship with the UK, it would be possible to do that in nine months? Um, is that even a remote possibility? I have to say, in my view, that is simply not in any conceptual, in any sort of world possible. And therefore, we have to be thinking in terms of you know, um, negotiating during a transitional arrangement a future relationship. Chris, thank you very much indeed for those two. <coughs> Stefan. Your thoughts? Yes. Um, on the fact that EU procedures somehow, you claim, well, they're not fit for purpose in a way, I would obviously take issue with that. I think we have done remarkably well in terms of putting things in the right order, adopting European Council guidelines, so that's the highest level, EU leaders, President Tusk, Juncker negotiating directives adopted by the Council, which for the first time the Commission's recommendation, I believe for the first time, was made public. And then we come out with our position papers. And position papers are tabled by the negotiating team. They go, they're <coughs> transparently published and they're given to the 27 member states. We exchange views and then we transmit them to the UK. So I think we have, with that, 
that's the framework in which we negotiate, which seems entirely logic to me. And, uh, and that has creates that unity as well. John earlier said, will this unity be rigidly enforced in phase two? The, rich, the unity is not enforced, it's organically grown for at least up until now uh, in, in these negotiations. Now, I'm not going to reopen the treaty by, by commenting Article 50. Article 50 is what it is. The UK Parliament has ratified it, like any other 28, 28 member states have ratified the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, it is my recollection, and I think it's correct, that the end date, the, the, the time period was put there by various people, but there was certainly an argument for people who said, we really want to be able to leave the EU. We need a time limit. You can't imprison us here by not having a deal. So if there's no deal, we need to be able to go. So part of the logic of, of that time period uh, lies, uh, lies in that political argument as well. We have, on each of the three issues, we have six, seven weeks, I believe, for the, between now and the December European Council. And on each of the issues, it is feasible to reach sufficient progress. On the citizens, we, are, we need to look at enforcement still and what happens with case law of the European Court and after Brexit, how do we do that to ensure consistency? We have issues of family reunification, exportability of social security benefits that are still on the table. In the financial settlement, the Florence speech made a very important step, but that sentence that Britain will honor its commitment is still out there and, and, and our UK friends told us we can't specify right now. So we need, we need to do that. And in Northern Ireland, you're very right in saying that the UK leaving the legal framework of the EU, Northern Ireland leaving the legal framework of the EU complicates yeah. the functioning of the North-South cooperation and the Good Friday Agreement. And we still need some progress there to make sure we have a a really good common understanding of what the challenges are that, res that, that result from that. Just very finally on how easy it will be and how quick, we can arrive at a very good framework for the future relationship in my view by autumn 2018. Your point on we are a member now, so how, how difficult could it be? The point there is of course UK will no longer be a member and what does it mean that the UK wants to diverge in terms of regulations in the future? And that is something that will need a serious discussion in, in 2018. All right, but Chris's first point is, is there one of the three conditions that is more difficult than the others in your view? Or they're all within reach? Let's say each of them has its own <laughs> characteristics. <So. laughs> it does. Jill. Um, so I think everybody's, uh, everybody's probably taken almost everything I, uh, I had thought of as I was writing notes uh, as Stefan was speaking, but, um, uh, but I'm going to have a go nonetheless. If you don't, I've got lots of questions. And thank so you very on. much for all the references to, to the excellent publications by Team Brexit, so and thanks to those in the audience. I just want to come back just a bit on, um, on sufficient progress. So I'm looking at the questions that David Davis said yesterday, he would have suggested the, the exiting the EU committee might ask Michel Barnier when he gives evidence to them in a couple of weeks. Uh, week's time, I assume they're going to Brussels, I don't know. He, uh, his first question was, what does sufficient progress mean? And he's very interesting, on the money is, does it mean a number? I mean, does the Prime Minister actually have to put her signature on a cheque for a certain amount, or can it just be a methodology, something like that? Um, I take the other points on, on Ireland and on citizens' rights. I think it's very interesting <coughs> to quite see how you're going to resolve citizens' rights. Um, but on sufficient progress, I'm quite interested then on to, uh, you'll have seen, uh, if you've been following the British debate, that we now have some new concepts around no deal. And we have what Philip Hammond has labelled a bad-tempered no deal. Mm. And we have uh, what we might describe, and I think in an Institute for Graf Government Graphic coming to somewhere near you uh, soon, it's going to be called an amicable no deal, where things are sort of going quite well, it's not a sort of big breakdown or whatever, um, where we don't get to, to the final stage on the free trade deal. Maybe we decide that you know, for trade we have to do WTO, but we notice that no major trading country trades with the EU on WTO terms alone. That would put us in a list that goes from Mauritania to Yemen to, I think Ivan Rogers yesterday said, Venezuela, pick your obscure country. Um, 
but loads of people have lots of flanking agreements on customs cooperation, <coughs> on data sharing, on aviation, potentially on some sort of participation. So is there a sort of no deal scenario that might be a soft, a soft no deal? Soft. We talk all the time about soft Brexit, but is there, is there potentially oh, no. No, no. a soft no <laughs> deal? On I only just invented that. Um, and the final no. thing, uh, being an uh, extreme reader of Michel Barnier and, uh, and loving many of his things, Sometimes he talks about this being an absolute binary choice, nothing bespoke for the UK. You basically have to do Norway. If you don't want Norway, it's Canada. Canada, of course, is deeply bespoke to Canada. Before CETA, Canada didn't exist as a model. So as far as I can see, all free trade deals are fundamentally quite bespoke. But then in other circumstances, he recognises that this is unprecedented. It's totally different to any other trade deal we've had because Everybody else, it's about an attempt to create areas of convergence, to create value. This is an, a way of managing divergence. You ask to sort of, you know, you might say reduce value losses or to enable the UK to explore other sources of value in its longer run future. So is it really impossible to use the words that we're delving for, flexible, imaginative, creative, whatever else, to actually find a very different way of thinking about the future trade relationship, which could say, actually, this isn't about a bottom-up, line-by-line negotiation. It's actually, you are convergent. We have respected your regulators uh, as of 29 March 2019. That doesn't change on 30th March 2019. And actually, what we need to do is instead institute some process which enables you to manage that divergence in a way that sort of minimises the downsides for both the community, respects the integrity of the single market, communities' rulemaking, etc., but also uh, allows the UK to say it's taken back mm. some control. It may not exercise very much of it, but at least it's taken it mm. back. So is there not a totally different paradigm that you could be thinking of? So those are my questions. So these are really, really good questions. OK, so does, does uh, sufficient progress mean a number? Uh, is a no deal that can be a soft version of it that's not so bad and Jill's at last uh, forceful point about um, uh, look is, isn't there really a need for a bespoke deals because we start off from a point of convergence um, on the first point we just remind ourselves that we have published actually our essential principles on the financial settlement it's online you can, you can consult it and you can see in there what the EU expects, what the EU expects. So it speaks about the share of the UK and how we think that should be calculated. And it speaks about various union obligations, outstanding commitments, the financial programming period, the liabilities, and so on and so on. So that is what we what we negotiate actually as an annex with all the, the legal bases and can go through it line by line. There are many, you know, so it's out there. It is quite clear what this means. We need a method to define what happens on the date of withdrawal in terms of how we settle uh, the past accounts, which will be then be past accounts the day after withdrawal, basically. Uh, so, and a lot of these things are actually publicly available in, in the current accounts, um, in the consolidated accounts of the union. So, so that's that's for that aspect. In the end, it, the decision on sufficient progress, you say, well, what does Michel Barnier have in mind? He has some clear things in mind. He has even spoken about this publicly, what he expects. I believe at the end of the second or third negotiation round, so we have published that as well. But So let's not me run through that again, but eventually the decision is, of course, one for the European Council to take. And as the European Council said, we will reassess that progress in December. I wouldn't want to entertain too much the notion of no deal and all the variants. I mean, it's not our, our work. It's not our. It's not what we were, where we want to end up. It's not the hypothesis we're working on. So I'm not going to start qualifying various variations on something we do not want. <laughs> so, so in terms of the model, well, we will start constructing first of all. I, and, and it would be imprudent for me to say too many things on the future relationship because we need a discussion at 27. But clearly, and I come back to the general point, there is a balance of rights and obligations in the Norway model and the Canada model, and we're not going to start mixing in a way that without having the obligations, you get suddenly more rights. And I think 
if I would make, and I mentioned that also in my introductory remarks, based on the negotiation rounds that we had so far, there is a clear feeling that at some point you, people need to accept that you have two different jurisdictions, two different markets. And that has far-reaching consequences, and people need to think through the consequence of that. Now, how you, and you link that market to the trade agreement, that will be the subject of 2018, and how you define the framework for that future relationship will be hopefully the subject of 2018. But I don't think I can say much more to that, except for the fact that the models are there, and the UK will be a third country, and so the diff different countries, different third country models are out there. Okay, thanks for that. Let's go to some questions. And uh, for all the wizardry of our technology, if you are in the next door room, you will have to walk to the door and stick your head around. <laughs> Great. Let's start in the, uh, here in the front. Thank you very much. Can you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you very much, Gary Gibbon from Channel Four News. Could I um, ask uh, sufficient progress on what uh, uh, clearly, quite offensively, gets called the bill over here, as you've noticed? Um, it sounds like you're looking for uh, us to adopt some headings f from the spreadsheet. But the problem for the British government is that the headings all point at numbers. Can you tell me how we get over that? <laughs> and, and, and just one other, if I may. Um, how definitive do you think the uh, future framework outline of agreement needs to be at the end of the day? Because it looks as though when this government makes its choice, uh, it potentially combusts. So it's going to keep trying to kick that can down the road as it's done already. It hasn't even discussed it at cabinet level. Um, and it could be we have a different government halfway through the transition that has a different view. That's even a third question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go, go, go ahead. And I'm going to come back to the panel, particularly on some, some uh, UK <coughs> aspects. But um, no, please. Well, yes, I, I'm terribly bad with numbers myself, so... <laughs> but, uh, uh, again, we have one element is basically contained in the Florence speech, and that is the current payments up until the end of 2020. And there is a clear commitment there from the UK government to that aspect of the financial settlement. There are, in terms of big headings, if I can put it like that, two more issues out there. One is the liabilities. That includes contingent liabilities, such as loans to third countries, such as Ukraine, which the EU has guaranteed. And there is what is called the outstanding commitments. In other words, the way this works, at the end of 2020, there will be, in 2021, bills on the table of the EU. There will be bills that will come to the table of the EU. And there will be projects that have been legally committed and will be rolled out up until the end of 2023 maximum, in terms of the cohesion policy and how that works. Now, we need to define the share of the UK, based on what we have put in our paper, of those outstanding commitments. How much these commitments will be at the withdrawal or at, at the end of 2020 is an unknown issue today. But we need to define the method. Of course, at some point, that method will lead to a number. That is clear. But in terms of sufficient progress, we need a method to be able to reassure the 27 of the solidity of the UK guarantees on how it will honor its commitments and how we will therefore settle the accounts. On the future, again, I'm speaking here at a time where the 27 start internal work on the scoping of the future relationship and on the possible transition. So, you will forgive me for not being too specific on those issues as the 27 and the European Parliament indeed need to do some internal preparatory work also with, with the union negotiator. In terms of timing, which is on the underlying point of your question as well, I think, what I said is that we could, by autumn 2018, and hopefully make as much progress as possible and come to a solid definition of the framework for the future relationship on which negotiations will only be able to be finalized, concluded, once the UK is no longer a member. So that is then the process that starts after the withdrawal of the UK. Um, changes of 
government and all those questions, well, we obviously negotiate with the UK government. Any country that joins the EU, let's say Croatia is the last government that has joined the EU, well, you have a government that negotiates the accession terms, and that then binds Croatia into <laughs> on the accession terms. So the government in charge is the one that defines the, fr the, the relationship, basically, at, a, at that particular moment in time. All right, next question. It's, uh, come here in the front. Thank you. Carl Dillon, ITV News. Um, a couple of quick questions. Uh, is it plausible, should sufficient progress be made by the December Council to work on and agree the framework for a transitional deal in the first three months of next year, as David Davis has suggested? And on another issue, many people here are very puzzled as to how it is possible to decide the status of the Irish border without having any idea what the future customs agreement between the UK and the EU will be. How, how do you get around that? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, the conclusion of the European Council for, say very clearly, we will reassess state of progress in December. And if that on each of the issues has been achieved, if so, the European Council will adopt additional guidelines for the framework for the future and the possible transition. And so it is certainly the, the possible transition, as, as it is mentioned in there, could indeed, in my view, with, with some prudence I should speak, because we need to work with the 27 on that, but could indeed be wrapped up very quickly. But that will depend on, first of all, reaching sufficient progress, and secondly, on those additional guidelines that the European <coughs> Council will need to adopt. So there is still a discussion to be had at 27 before one can answer your question with, with, with full clarity. Um, on Ireland, I think it is indeed often a, a bit of a confusion in the debate there. <coughs> But we need further, the border in Ireland is not just a customs border. It's a societal, political border. It has been a symbol of conflict, of divisions. And so what we are doing in this phase right now is focus on the Good Friday Agreement. And indeed, we are working very well with the UK government on those issues. Now, we have put out a paper in September on the six guiding principles which we think are important in the discussions on the Good Friday Agreement. We now jointly work on those principles. And the first thing that we need to do right now as a matter of priority is to map how that North-South cooperation, which is foreseen in the Good Friday Agreement, continues once Northern Ireland has left the EU legal framework. To make this concrete, there are more than a hundred kind of domains where that North-South cooperation applies. And it is facilitated by, let's say you do common waterway management, it's facilitated by common norms within the EU legal framework. If you think about patient mobility across the border, it is today framed by the social security coordination of the, of the European Union. The peace programs and the interreg programs today are cross-border programs that are funded by the European Union. All of this needs to be clarified first before and then we need to start imagining the solution because we need an imaginative solution unique to Ireland in terms of what that border means post-Brexit. But whether technicalities will be needed at the border in terms of border checks and what kind of systems you use in terms of customs, of course that will have to be framed as well once you know the final customs relationship between the UK and the EU with the addition that you could think about unique solutions also for the island of Ireland. Because we have said from the EU side, we're ready to think about unique such solutions, as long as they respect the integrity of the single market and the customs union. So inevitably, the border implies border checks, and how that will be facilitated uh, will then be, will be part of that discussion. Okay, we take one more, and then I'm gonna come back to the panel. Yes. Uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? David Haney, yet another former permanent representative to the EU. Um, first of all, no deal. Uh, and the juxtaposition of John, who 
I think, attributed to others than himself, the view that if you aren't prepared to walk away, you have no leverage. Uh, and your view, Stefan, that a mutual benefit was what drives a negotiation. I would opt firmly for the second, particularly in circumstances where the people you're negotiating with know perfectly well that you will be more damaged than they will by walking away. So, but on the no deal, it may surprise you to know, uh, Stefan, that there are a lot of people in this country who believe that no deal means we will stay in the European Union. Uh, it might be quite a good idea if they were disabused of that view. Uh, and the best way to disabuse, surely, would be at some stage for the European Union side to simply say factually what would happen on the 30th of March uh, if there was no deal. I'm not suggesting they should launch, or the British side for that matter, into a long econometric survey of what the state of British incomes would be in 15 years' time afterwards. That's rather been discredited by during the referendum campaign. But there are a long, long, long list of things that would happen on the day after no deal, and nobody has a clue what they are. So don't you think it might be a good idea to set them down on a piece of paper where everyone could see them? And on the transition period, uh, clearly there is going to be a negotiation about that uh, whenever the <coughs> sufficient progress has been made. Uh, do you not think that given the very complex nature of what we're talking about, anybody who is negotiating on either side will be wise to make a provision which enables the length of the transition period to be extended if necessary. Okay, thanks for that. Mm. And after Stefan's answer, do you just the panel wants to comment on what Stefan has been saying. Mm. Any those questions? Just on transition, perhaps your final point, and then I'll climb back up to the other points. Uh, it is important, I think, that we, I think it was a principle expressed in this country, that business adapts once. So I think on the nature of a transition, that already gives some ideas on, on what we could be heading for. And I think the Institute of Government has actually done some very good work that shows the consequences of no deal. Uh, it, but it has to be time limited. That is absolutely clear for the EU. That's part of our European Council guidelines, which is our, our mandate, as you have understood. It's also part of the European Parliament's resolution that it is limited in time. So it cannot be an open-ended transition. Uh, that is not something that the EU will, will want to accept. On advertising no deal, Michel Barney gave a speech on that once, but it's also not something we want to advertise, oversell. <laughs> there is a clear negative impact from no deal. I think that, that, that is clear for both sides, but as you rightly say in your question, especially for, for the UK economy. But it's not a scenario that we, want to, that we want to work towards. We're preparing for it, that is for sure, at 27. Uh, but it's not a scenario that we in the negotiation room want to, want to bring in that negotiation room, if I, if I can put it like that. Uh, on fears of no deal meaning staying in the EU, that's something that I would kind of Yes, flatly contradict. <laughs> the, the notification and the process is very clear under the Article 50 Chris spoke about. Clearly the UK, as of the end of March 2019, is no longer a member. So that, that is absolutely clear. But not to everyone. Well, the question, the question of what British people actually think at the moment, I think is a very interesting one, which more polling would, um, I think, be uh, very useful for my sense is that quite a few people think we've left already. Um, Jill, your thoughts on, and particularly on this no deal? Um, uh, ruminations that we're having. Well, I think there is a very obvious opportunity for Michel Barnier to bring home to certainly parliamentarians what, no deal, what he thinks no deal makes, maybe remake some of the points that he made in his speech back in the summer about 100% animal export checks, etc., etc., which we all read and quote quite often when he does give evidence to the exiting the EU committee, because I think quite a lot of the people who believe that 
are in Parliament and they're some of the crucial <laughs> players. I mean, it's, it's why it does go to these sort of different sorts of no deal. There's sort of no, just no trade deal, but actually other things go on as normal. Uh, not much border because we're not ready, but nor are EU member states because we have this big debate about whether we should be spending contingency and potentially nugatory money on getting ready for Brexit. Um, people say, well, there may not be many sort of forklift trucks around <coughs> Dover, concreting over much of the area there to make room for lorry parks, but equally there's not that work going on in Calais or in Zeebrugge or Rotterdam to cope with lots and lots of checks for trade. So I think it would be a very useful occasion for Michel Barney to go there. I actually don't agree with David that most, most people think nothing changes. Uh, I think most people know perfectly well we leave the EU. I think it's what happens if we leave the EU and lots of the things that go with part of being the EU. Because as I think Bronwyn just said, people are, uh, people are sort of uh, generally think uh, we have left or why haven't we left already? I think is you only have to watch an episode of Question Time to see how that uh, that is coming in. I think there is one thing, uh, one thing about the sort of nature of Article 50, because I think the UK has sort of offered itself up to be a natural experiment <coughs> on does Article 50 work? Is Article 50 fit for purpose? I think, as Chris said, I mean, it clearly, if you want orderly exit, and both sides say they want orderly exit, Article 50 is clearly quite a defective process to sort of get to any sort of degree of certainty. Um, the idea that you have transition when you only have some very vague heads of agreement of what a future relationship looks like is clearly quite unsatisfactory. Uh, the timelines are nothing like the timelines agreed for accession where you know what you're exceeding to and things like that. So I think there is really an interesting sort of lessons learnt down mm. the line exercise for the, uh, for the Commission and the 27 to do about whether that is really uh, a good part of the process and maybe for next next yeah. treaty amendment to think about doing something better. It would be too late for us though. Yeah, so. <laughs> Great. Chris, uh, quick, two quick points. Quick, two yeah. quick comments. I think um, David Hannay's comment I think goes a little bit further which is that the New Deal scenario, the way it's being discussed here is there is also the view that the closer we get to New Deal the greater the impact on British, the British political scene will be and the balance will tip towards stepping back from what people describe as a cliff edge. Now, I don't know how many people think that this is worthwhile as a journey in order to try and reverse, in some way, the result of the, the referendum, but I have heard that being said. So I think it's more than just um, making clear how, how much of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an impact it would have on the British economy. It's the interaction with a very unstable, uh, historically incredibly unstable British political scene and the desire that this might actually push the UK to step back from wanting to leave the EU altogether. That's why it's being discussed so much. Um, the question I had for Stefan is, I think, probably quite a difficult question. Um, but um, do you think, I mean, in your view, would it have been possible to have uh, for the Good Friday Agreement to have been signed as it was had the UK not been a member state of the European Union? And if not, what does that tell us about the nature of the resolution of the Northern Irish conflict? Okay. John, do you have a quick point? You uh, yeah, well, uh, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts on the basis of the questions that we've had so far. I mean, I think, I think it is going to be an important part of this negotiation, and this goes back to the famous sequencing issue, that certainly the British side, but I think also on the European side, if you can talk, call them sides, people will want to emphasise that nothing is, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And I think that is going to be part, a key part of the, of the money. In the end, the, the British side will not want to make an offer in any sort of heads or whatever it is, such that um, that's it and it's done and we now have to hand the cheque over. Um, they won't actually want to be committed to it until they have a until the whole Brexit negotiation is, is, is completed. Um, but the other thought I have um, since last week is that I, I actually think the dynamics of this negotiation have now got into a position where it will be quite difficult for the European Council in December to say, sorry, you haven't made sufficient progress. Because I think given the way we have discussed it in the last couple of weeks, a, de a, a decision on the 15th of December there is not sufficient progress, we cannot move to phase two, 
mm. will be treated here and possibly mm. around the whole of the European Union as that's it, it's all over. Um, there is no purpose in having further negotiations. Mm. And I don't think, for the reasons that Stefan has been saying, um, that actually the European Union would want to be in a position where it is seen in December essentially to break off negotiations. Really good point. Um, Chris, if you forgive me, we'll come back to the Northern Ireland point, but, but a really, really good uh, challenge there. Let's co try and get in some more here on the aisle. Um, James Landell, BBC. Uh, what's your view of the stability and longevity of the UK government? Did you fear a transition of power within Downing Street? And, and how is that assessment shaping your negotiating decisions? Um, and secondly, if I may, uh, do you believe that Martin Selmer plays a positive role <laughs> in these negotiations? Is the first question addressed to me or to John? Both to you. throw it back to Jay. <laughs> no, um, let me start with the second question. The answer is, <laughs> is yes. I think it is very important that we in the Commission, we work as a team, we work with the Member States, we work with the European Parliament, all the institutions have shown a remarkable unity and I think that you would be hard pressed to find divisions within institutions at the moment when the institutions are cooperating strongly together and Michel Barnier, President Juncker and President Juncker's staff, we work as a single team on this. And to make that more concrete in terms of how negotiations work, we prepare position papers. Of course, we discuss them internally. That is a relatively smooth process. We have a collegial process even on these position papers with the members of the commission. Michel Barnier regularly goes to the college. And I'm not going to start n commenting on specific individual civil servants. Michel Barnier regularly meets as well with the president's staff. And so that's what I would like to say to your second question. On, on your first question, I, we have positions on the, around the negotiation table by the UK government. And that's what we work with. All the other questions are not relevant for us. So that's what I can say to that. Okay, <coughs> another one. Um, in the middle here, and uh, Matt Dathan from The Sun. Uh, Stefan, uh, Donald Tusk said earlier this week that it's up to London. Is, well, London could, if it wanted, um, reverse Brexit. Is this uh, true, and if so, how? Let's take that one, and we might, we might just dwell on <coughs> the reverse Brexit point with the, with the panel. Yep. Um. Well, up until the day of notification, as was said earlier in this panel, it was a unilateral decision of the UK <coughs> to notify the EU of its intention to withdraw. Now that the question, now that the intention and the formal letter for notification for the intention to withdraw has been there, this has become a, unanim a, uni a collective process of the European Union, I would say. But those, I mean, if and I should be very careful here in terms of hypotheticals, but I don't think it's up for the European Union to engineer. Our role is basically to manage the process that has been set in motion. And that process leads to the withdrawal end of March. That is what we have been asked to do by the European Council as negotiating team. So we are negotiating the withdrawal. That's what, that's, that's what my job basically consists of with Michel Barnier. Um, can I just... Um, Come back to one. You can, but um, well, I'm sorry. Could, 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 okay. Can I just ask you on, on this point? If Britain chose to reverse either a British government or uh, by a referendum chose to reverse Brexit uh, before March 19, uh, 2019 or after, what would the reaction be? Well, these are two hypotheticals. <laughs> if and then what would the reaction be? So I'm not going to enter into <laughs> into that field. <laughs> okay. Let me just uh, just ask the panel. Do you have views on the? reality of uh, the question of, of uh, reversing it and 
what would happen? Uh, Chris, go on. And then. I, think, I think Stefan is right. So this is a political decision. And the, the engine, the, the place where a decision like that would be taken is the European Council amongst the EU27. And this is really for heads of state and, and government to decide. Um, I'd be very surprised if, um, if there was a determination to continue the process with an unwilling exiting member state. That seems to me not to make any sense. But it would be decided at that level unquestionably. I think, I think we had this point raised um, sort of, you know, in July last year uh, here with a former head of Commission Legal Services, I think, about whether Article 50 could be revoked if, we'd, uh, if we triggered it. And the view there, and that was before sort of various people decided to try and test it in courts, which didn't seem to get anywhere, but um, that ultimately it would be a political decision. I think the really interesting thing would be if by unanimity the Council and then the Parliament all agreed it was fine, UK could be back, maybe not on terribly advantageous terms or whatever, but you know, I think the idea was we might have to underwrite some of the costs of Michel Barney and his team and the efforts that the Commission <laughs> done, you know, sort of almost like frivolous and malicious wasting police time sort of thing, um, but that we would be, you know, be, we'd probably be allowed back in. I think it'd be an interesting issue if any member state or any, or the parliament or someone decided to challenge that, whether we'd find it ultimately uh, going to the European Court, um, whether we could unilaterally revoke or not. Um, I think it's totally different though if we left because if we left then there are procedures for re-entering the EU and we then become an applicant country. There isn't a provision for a re-entering sort of prodigal son clause in Article 50 or a cooling off period where you can see whether you like being outside for a couple of years, say that didn't seem so good or whatever, actually will hop back in on the same terms as before. So I think they are quite different, different things, but as uh, Stefan rightly said, completely hypothetical. Thanks. Uh, Stefan, you wanted to pick up on a point. Well, I just wanted to say one thing on we should learn lessons from Article 50 that I would hope that we can leave that question to the <laughs> academic community because for us, this is a one-off that shouldn't happen <laughs> afterward. So okay. there are no lessons to be learned <laughs> for okay. any <laughs> precedent. Let me take two <laughs> questions together. Here, here, uh, the woman here. Uh, sorry, no, in front of you, yeah. Thank you, Natasha Ryan from Business Organization London First. I have two questions for the whole panel. Uh, the first question is, do you think that there is um, that there are two definitions for transition agreement, one from the EU side and one from the British side, where in the UK we talk about it more as a continuation of status quo and for the EU side it's more about where we're going next. <coughs> and my second question is, could you comment on the possibility or not, no possibility of extension of Article 50? Um, uh, and I'm sorry, here in the front is the next one. or the next two, as it may be. In the Thank you. Um, Paul Adamson, Lee Sharm Magazine. A question which kind of builds on James Landdale's first question, Stefan. Um, I understand Mr. Bani and his task force, and you including that, in that group have had uh, talks with uh, the Labour Party from Britain, Mr. Um, Corbyn and uh, Keir Starmer. Could you give us a flavour of somehow those talks have gone? And if you say no comment, I have a second question, which is on <laughs> the European Parliament. As you know better than I do, the Parliament's very good at trying to insert itself into a process which it has, which it has no formal role. Having said that, the closer we get to a, a final deal, if a deal is struck, um, then of course they have to be involved, as you said in your earlier remarks. How, how does, uh, does Michel Barnier and you, as a group, uh, kind of prepare the ground for that? So uh, we can't just give a deal to the Parliament without knowing surely in advance how well it will be received. You need to have some kind of discussions which are not sort of specified in the Article 50 procedure. So how, do you, how are you going to go around finessing the Parliament as you get closer to a, to a deal? Thank you. Great. Um, Stefan, do you want to comment on that? I'm going to bring in um, particularly John on this. Go on. Um, so we had uh, yes, nature of transition, um, interpretations of transition, extending Article 50, um, and um, uh, labor talks. Yeah, on the transition, again, possible transition, we need to start working on guidelines. But if you look at the, the guidelines that exist, the prolongation of the acquis, as it's called, of the full set of European Union rules is mentioned. Uh, with all the conditions attached to that, including the, the time limitation. So that's what I, what I can say about transition. Michel Barnier has met um, Jeremy Corbyn twice, I believe. He has also met Carvin Jones, Nicola Sturgeon. He has met the committee of the House of Lords. 
I believe he has met a delegation from the Scottish Parliament. He has met people uh, from the Commons as well. And uh, so he, he wants to listen to all points of view and positions that are out there in, in, the, in the UK debate, always making clear, including when we met with Jeremy Corbyn, we're not in any negotiations. And indeed, Jeremy Corbyn made that very clear himself. So it was just a listening kind of exercise of where do we stand. We have also agreed that these, you know, that, that's basically what, what I can say on, uh, on those meetings uh, now. Um, on the Parliament, as you say, and well, Parliament has a formal role. Parliament has to ratify uh, the withdrawal agreement. Mm. So that, uh, it's very important to keep that in mind. And it links also to something which was mentioned earlier. Can, can the Article 50 period be extended? I think the, somebody asked that question just earlier also. Uh, well, again, it's a hypothetical today. It can be extended by unanimity. So UK needs to agree, the 27 need to agree. So I cannot say much more about it than that, but I would note that it, that discussion would happen a few months before the European Parliament elections. So we will be in a different political environment uh, as far as the European Union is concerned uh, in the early months of 2019. The way Michel Barnier works with the Parliament is to involve them very closely, is to listen to them, take their concerns on board, but also feed them with all the information and update them on the state of play. So he meets them before every negotiation round and he meets them after every negotiation round. And he meets them at other occasions as well in what is called the Brexit Steering Group, which is the leaders of the political groups and the chairs of some crucial EP committees, basically. <coughs> so that leads to discussions that also inform how we basically then also negotiate and what issues and how we how we, how we position ourselves in those negotiations. So it is indeed important to do that now, with then leading up to, to, to the ratification and to the vote and the debate on the withdrawal agreement. The final thing I want to say to that, of course, the Parliament has already a debate on Brexit regularly at the occasion of European Council debates. Uh, so the plenary of the Parliament in Strasbourg then already takes stock of where we stand and, and gives political indications. The Parliament has also adopted a resolution very recently before the European Council. So the Parliament is extremely active in this process as, as it should be. Okay, great. Let me try and squeeze in two last questions and use that as the panel um, giving their last thoughts as well because we need to end hard at two. I'm going to go to the most patient, which is over here. Um, and then here. Yes, uh, Thomas Cole from Open Britain. Uh, it was speculated in Politico this morning that there could be a further round of talks and these are already potentially scheduled for the next few weeks. Could you give us your views on when you see the next round of talks taking place? Thank you. Thank you. And, and apologies to those who I, I can't uh, get in. <coughs> Peter Unwin from the Whitehall and Industry Group. Uh, the history of all international negotiations, both international such as international climate change or within the EU such as the Greek debt crisis, is that things go down to the wire and beyond. And you either have a heads of term agreement uh, with then endless sort of successive conferences afterwards to deal with all the details, or you stop the clock and continue in some way. What makes you feel this is going to be different and you're going to move to the smooth gestation period after the next nine months to be ready for ratification? Great. Um, both good. Let's, let's, let's start uh, though with the panel and come back to you uh, last. Uh, Chris, your views on uh, Just a, a, a quick final comment. I think about the extension of Article 50, the transition period I think is a de facto extension of Article 50. It seems to me inevitable that within the terms of Article 50 you can't, uh, you can't conclude the negotiations. Um, a more orderly way to do it would be to extend, but even then that extension is itself reasonably circumscribed and wouldn't pave the way, I think, for the negotiation of a substantial free trade yeah. agreement. So time is pressing even with, a, with an extension of Article 50, but I think that's almost, <coughs> almost inevitable at this stage. Thanks for that. John, uh, yes. answer these questions. And no, I, I, I think yeah. I want to make three, three comments, which I'll keep as brief as I can. Yeah. Transition, um, just to advertise them. Um, I have a piece in tomorrow's issue looking at transition. Um, as so often, it's, it's more complicated than it looks. Um, and I, one, one reason for that is that uh, the, the most watertight way of transiting <coughs> would indeed be to extend Article 50, which can be done by unanimity. But clearly, if you do that, Britain would continue to be a member of the European <laughs> Union. That 
has political implications here, but doing transition in some other way will be quite difficult. And I share David's view that although a time limit is clearly desired by all sides, and it's desired here and it's desired by the European Parliament and the European Union, um, we all know that two years is not going to be enough. Quite probably three years is not going to be enough. And the question of how can you roll forward transition is going to be quite complicated, both legally and politically, not least because it will then hit the next UK elections. So transition is, is itself an awkward area. I am clear, and I have always been clear, that the only form of transition that will be on offer is essentially to prolong the acquis. And when, for example, Michael Gove says, well, no, we'll have to take back fisheries straight away on, on March the 30th, 2019, because we can't have fish quotas set by the European Union without us having a say, I don't think that's going to be acceptable. As soon as you start fiddling with bits of the transition, you're into a new negotiation, which is going to be impossible to, to settle. <coughs> on um, revocation and also on extension, well, I've mentioned extension, but revocation of Article 50, <coughs> um, I've always, again, felt, to, to use the Prime Minister's phrase, let me be very clear, um, uh, politically, there's no question that we could withdraw this application to, to leave at any time, because it would be a triumph for the European Union to be able to say, well, look, a country tried to leave, and they found it too complicated and too difficult, and they decided it was going to be too negative, so they come back into the fold. But I very strongly share Jill's view that from the 1st of April 2019, it will be back to, you apply under Article 49, it requires unanimous approval, and I wouldn't be surprised if getting unanimous approval would be very difficult. Um, I think many people will say the general was right and we should, um, we should never have let them in in the first place. Um, and then my, my last comment was on, on the parliaments, um, both parliaments actually, because it comes up in this country as well. Clearly the European Parliament has a vote as laid down by the treaty. The British government has also said that the British Parliament will have a vote and we finally got yesterday clarity that that vote will take place before we leave, not after we leave. Um, uh, but I think in practice, I'm not sure those votes are going to make a huge difference. I, I can't see the European Parliament rejecting a deal that has been signed by 27 countries, and I can't actually see the House of Commons doing the same thing either. Where it really matters is that because they have those votes, both the House of Commons and the Select Committee and the European Parliament can play a role in the negotiations. And I think, so it's the process that leads up to the deal. That's when both parliaments need to be involved. It's not the actual signing off that, that, that will matter, because I think to reject the deal when it's been done would just lead to no deal, which would be a disaster for all sides. Jill. Um, I just want to pick up two points. One on transition. I think, uh, I think I thought the Florence speech signalled that basically the Prime Minister had accepted pretty much the, uh, the EU's terms for transition, which was it was a status quo transition. You saw that in the language about only having to make one set of changes. That would enable you to get ready for things. She then had this slightly odd idea that there could be different transitions, different lengths of implementation for different issues. Obviously, if you're moving to a new relationship, you may take time before various provisions start to kick in. That could be in in the new relationship, but I think uh, I think it's now pretty clear what uh, that actually the UK will accept the ECJ for another little bit of time. It um, will accept the acquis. We've had this row about does it mean we'll be implementing loads of new laws that we didn't have a say in, uh, where everybody's pointing to the lengthy time between agreement and transposition, so that de facto it doesn't matter. So I think that's what we're we're being ready for. I just want to make one one sort of other point, which isn't about going back or not going back, but it goes a bit to the point about Herr Zellmeyer, who I don't know, but I'm terribly proud of that, thanks to talking to very senior former inside sources, uh, I did a thing called Times Red Box, where they said, Who's, what's the thing you need to, need to know as a bluffer's guide to Europe? And uh, uh, Oliver Wright from Times said, oh, you need to say Ollie Robbins is the key person. I said, no, you need to say Martin Zellmeyer is the key person. So I was really pleased about that when he then uh, got all over the press two weeks later for uh, his, uh, maybe not his, but the very detailed briefing of the FAZ after the famous dinner. I do think there is a sort of, one of the things that uh, the Commission, I think, and I'm sure the representation London does, needs just to sort of watch the way the EU comes over here. I know our press refracts things in a very interesting, interesting, not necessarily very sympathetic way, uh, but the sense that you know every time we put things forward, they're described as thin or fantasy land and stuff like that doesn't necessarily um, enable the atmosphere to be incredibly good around the negotiations or create a sort of atmosphere in which ministers who may end up having to sell quite difficult compromises 
And I think there's some really interesting indications of ministers with, you know, who are beginning to confront some of the realities as they have to take quite difficult audience with them as to why we are having to do things a different way. I think some of the atmospherics could make life much easier for both sides. So just a sort of thing to pay a bit of attention to is just, you know, just how that comes across uh, over here. And knowing that we're now sort of on our way out and therefore not a prime focus of attention anymore. Jill, I think it's an excellent point. So thanks for that. Stefan, we'll come to you. We had these two, two, two questions. And also, I just wondered if you could pick up on Jill's point about whether the EU should do more to take account of the pressures on the UK government. I think in terms of the public debate, which is Jill's point, as I, as I understood it, is, of course, the EU institutions can, can help shape it. But in essence, it's structured and driven by national leaders, in my view. And I think so the, the first responsibility for the quality of a debate on what the European Union is or how things are going, in my view, lies, lies with national leaders in the broad sense of the terms, political, economic, social, uh, social actors. Um, there were a few specific questions on, you know, we have indeed, yeah. we're looking for rounds of negotiations. Uh, Michel Barnier has proposed to have three rounds in now in December. We're looking with our UK partners when, when that would happen. So, so we're working on that. Chris points on the Good Friday Agreement, if I can just mm -hmm. take 30 yeah. seconds on that. Yeah. It was the EU essential, or I don't know how you exactly put it. I mean, clearly, it's a peace process, or the tribute goes to the communities that, that were not at peace before. That's, that, that's what a peace process is. The EU, no doubt, has played a facilitating role in that. And so taking away the Union's legal framework in Northern Ireland <coughs> raises then challenges, that, that's very clear. And the final point is on go to the wire and um, I think f from the gentleman there, we would certainly want to avoid that. I mean, Brexit is a process that we want to manage in a calm and rational way. That's, that's Brexit for the European Union. Uh, it's a process to be managed. And I don't think we need to add risk to that process by, by postponing, by playing with time. We need to use the time available for the best possible outcome. Well, Stefan, thank you. With that, we have run out of time our, our, ourselves. Um, thank you so much for your remarks, including dropping the phrase calm and serenity of 2018 into the whole discussion. It's one that we have actually not heard before from anyone uh, here or there. So thank you very much. Thank you to our panel. Thank you all for coming. Great questions.